Hi, I'm Dr. Martin Samuels. I'm Chief of Neurology at the Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston and Harvard Medical School. And what we're going to do is to show you how to do a neurological examination on a normal person, give you some idea how we run through the neurological examination. And our volunteer today is Alan, who's come in to help us out today. Thanks for coming in. I'm Dr. Samuels. What we'd like to do is show people how to do a neurological examination. Uh, the neurological examination really evolved gradually over time. It isn't something that was invented. I like to think of it as being something like baseball in that way. Uh, it wasn't invented by somebody. It just gradually changed with time. And uh, the one we use now here early in the 21st century was, was really put on the map in the, uh, in the late part of the 19th century by the great uh, European groups of uh, neurologists in, uh, in London and Paris and Belgium and so on. They gradually put together a neurological examination that we still use. This uh, exam uh, really has seven components to it, and almost every neurologist in the world uses the seven component neurological examination. Now, in reality, of course, we don't always do them in this order, but uh, for today, just to learn how to do the examination, I'm going to go through them in this uh, sort of compulsive order. In reality, of course, in your office, you're not going to do this entire examination. Your exam is going to be tailored to the situation. It's going to depend on the person's complaint. And when you're working in the hospital, you may have to shorten the exam. You may have to do it in a different order because the patient just won't be able to cooperate because of their illness. Uh, in particular with their neurological illness with uh, every aspect of it. But today, just for the sake of learning the examination, what we're going to do is go right through the examination uh, one through seven. Th these seven components are a general physical examination with special emphasis on the neurological features of the general exam. And then we're going to go to the more standard neurological examination, which is a mental status exam, a cranial nerve examination, uh, an examination of the motor system, of the sensory system, examination of coordination and gait, and then uh, reflexes, which is the final part of the examination. The, uh, the way you uh, record this examination uh, is really important because uh, other people are going to depend on how you record it, what you've written down about it, and of course you're going to depend on it too because uh, when you see the patient again in a few hours, days, weeks, months, years later, you're going to look back at that uh, note and you're going to depend on how that examination is recorded. So it's very important to record it accurately. And I can tell you that even after doing this for all these years, I still uh, like to record it in this compulsive way, one through seven, general exam, mental status, cranial nerves, motor sensory coordination, and reflexes, even if I don't actually carry the examination out in that order. One last little introductory point about this, and that is, uh, uh, there are sometimes parts of the exam that we just don't feel are relevant. It's, it's not practical in the modern era to spend two hours uh, with somebody doing a neurological examination, as we will here today. Doctors have to work uh, at, in 15-minute intervals, by and large, maybe 30-minute intervals. So the reality is we're not going to do this whole examination. It's important to, when you write your note to say specifically what it is that you did uh, and what, what you didn't do, so that people don't uh, misconstrue the, the note later, thinking that something was normal when, in fact, you never actually did that part of the exam. There's nothing wrong with that. You just have to be honest with yourself and with others about what, you, uh, what you're going to do. So let's start with the uh, main components of the general examination. Obviously, the general physical examination is in its own right uh, a big deal. It could take a very long time. But there are only certain aspects of it that we would routinely do as uh, neurologists. Um, and that really is an examination of the cardiovascular uh, system, and in particular the cerebrovascular system. A quick look at the heart and the extremities. Uh, and that would be enough for a reasonable examination. This is where I put the uh, examination of the autonomic nervous system into my, uh, into my examination. So let me show you how I might uh, start uh, doing that. Let's start with a standard uh, blood pressure measurement. On Alan here, just have your right arm here. Alan, I'll take your blood pressure. What we're going to do is uh, have you lie down here on, the, uh, on this uh, examining table, and I'm going to test the blood pressure lying down, and then we're going to test it uh, sitting and then standing. So we're actually testing the autonomic nervous system here, maintenance of the blood pressure in the upright posture. So let's take his blood pressure, and I think all of you know how to put the cuff on and to measure the blood pressure, so I'm not going to uh, emphasize that. Let's just have a look and see what Alan's uh, blood pressure is today. I hope I'm not making him too anxious with the white coat syndrome here, and it uh, doesn't look like I have. 
because his blood pressure is uh, 108 over 60. So he's going to live forever with that with that blood pressure. Let's have you uh, let's have you sit on the examining table now, uh, Alan. I also took his uh, heart rate uh, in that lying position, and I'm going to take it again. His heart rate was about 72 in the lying position. I'm going to test it again sitting. So I tested lying, tested immediately upon sitting. Let's do that again and see uh, what his blood pressure is in the sitting position. So it's 110 over 64 in the sitting position. His heart rate is uh, solid at, uh, at about uh, 72. And let me have you just stand here at the side of the examining table and just stand there. Uh, in reality, what we, what we would want to do if the complaint uh, for which he came to see me had anything to do with dizziness, dizziness on standing up, I would do this and then I would, I would actually let him stand here for five minutes and repeat the blood pressure and heart rate again after five minutes because some people don't develop the orthostatic symptoms for a little while. In reality, I'm not going to do that here uh, today. First of all, I don't have any reason to think that that's his problem. And uh, secondly, I'm not going to make you look at me for five minutes while I wait for uh, that period to pass. Let's see what his blood pressure did in the upright posture. It's still about 106 over 64. So his blood pressure uh, stayed the same, lying, sitting, and on standing. In his case, I'm not going to wait for a delayed standing. If there's anything that the patient tells you that might bring out a feeling of dizziness in upright posture, you'd actually have them do that. Sit down, Alan. Thanks very much. Um, you'd actually have them do that. So if the person said, I, I get this after I climb stairs or uh, after I suddenly stand, we'd actually have them do that in the office. I often will have people actually hyperventilate uh, in the squatting position and then have them stand up and see if I can reproduce that, uh, that kind of dizziness, see if their blood pressure or heart rate changes. Remember, if the heart rate goes up and the blood pressure does not uh, fall, this is called the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which uh, ordinarily means that there's a mild degree of autonomic instability. The heart rate is trying to compensate. That can also be caused by anxiety, but you can see that Alan is not, uh, not particularly anxious. His heart rate didn't go up on standing. His blood pressure didn't fall on standing. Now, let me just do uh, one or two things about the cardiovascular system, just to be sure those uh, are intact. We'd want to uh, uh, listen to his heart. You should remember, of course, put your hand over the heart and feel that point of maximal impulse right there which is in a nice normal location. Let me have you just raise your shirt enough so I can listen to your heart. So he doesn't have a, any heart murmur. I can hear the sounds very clearly. And I'm not going to do a detailed, uh, complete exam uh, uh, of his heart because, there, again, there's no indication for it. But I want to just remind you that you should look at people's uh, uh, heart, and if he's having trouble breathing, of course, you listen to his lungs as well. Now, let's emphasize the uh, cerebrovascular part of the examination. A lot of people like to feel uh, the carotids, and you can feel the carotids here in the uh, neck where I'm putting my fingers here. Now, this is probably an overrated uh, test. The, the truth is, when you put your fingers here, you don't really know what vessel you're feeling. You could be feeling the common carotid, you could be feeling the external carotid. It's actually unlikely that you're feeling the internal carotid, which is the part, the vessel that we really care about. Um, still, it's probably worth it if there's a big difference or a disappearance of the pulse on one side. That's probably useful. Now, should you listen with your stethoscope? A lot of people do, of course. Uh, it's, a, it's a debatable question uh, because it's not a very sensitive or specific test. If you are going to do it, listen here at the carotid bulb, just at the angle of the jaw with the bell of your stethoscope. Don't push very hard. You'll turn your bell into a diaphragm. And then say to the person, hold your breath for a second, Alan. Good, and breathe normally. I don't hear any unusual sounds there. Hold your breath, breathe normally. Good. And uh, if you suspect that there's disease in the distal internal carotid, you'd say, close your eyes, relax completely, get a nice suction there, open your eyes. I have him open his eyes because I want to get rid of the fluttering sound of his eyelids and I listen to see if I hear a brewy. And I don't. Close your eyes lightly 
open your eyes. What might be more useful than actually feeling and listening to the, uh, for a brewery is to actually measure the function of these cerebral vessels. And there's a way at the bedside to do this that we call dynamic palpation of the facial pulses. It requires a very simple principle. Uh, the high pressure system here is in the internal carotid artery. The blood comes up the internal carotid artery. If you remember, the first intracranial branch of the internal carotid is the ophthalmic artery. It comes out at right angles here to the eye, and it uh, ultimately ends in the central retinal artery, the artery we see with our ophthalmoscope. The external carotid uh, branches out here onto the face, and there are branches that go behind the ear, the occipital artery, and in front of the ear. The one in front of the ear is called the preauricular artery, and I can feel that very easily in virtually everybody, and I can feel it very easily in him. This artery then goes up here and branches onto the scalp and uh, produces, among others, a couple of descending arteries here in the uh, forehead, which go, go down toward the eye. One of them uh, runs in this little notch, the trochlear notch. This is called the supertrochlear artery, and the one next to it is called the angular artery. I can feel all those in him. Now, in a, in a normal person with an open carotid, internal carotid, the blood flows up the internal carotid and it comes out toward us, out of the eye. And when it gets to the orbit, it goes outward, away, centrifugally away from the eye. So therefore, if I were to feel that pulse in the, in the trochlear notch and put another finger here on the preauricular pulse and then compress the preauricular pulse, I should not alter that, that pulse uh, in the trochlear notch because the blood should be coming from the inside out. This is called dynamic palpation. So I, I feel both pulses simultaneously. I press on the preauricular and I don't feel any difference in this vessel. That's normal. On the other hand, if the internal carotid were tightly stenosed to the point where it was hemodynamically embarrassed, blood would start flowing up the external carotid onto the face and go backwards centripetally into the eye. And therefore, if I put pressure on the preauricular artery, I would feel that pulse disappear at the angle of the, uh, of the nose, either the angular artery or the uh, supertrochlear artery, or both of them. That would be abnormal. You would only see that in a tightly stenosed or occluded uh, internal carotid, somewhere between the origin of the carotid and the takeoff of the ophthalmic. Now, that test, of course, does not distinguish between a tightly stenosed and a totally occluded vessel. You can't decide based on that test, but it does tell you that there's a hemodynamically significant lesion. You can take it one step further, although m many people don't anymore because we have ultrasound that's so easily available, but if you're examining a person you don't have ultrasound, what you can do is you can take your ophthalmoscope here and uh, you can look in the, uh, in the eye. I'll come back to look using the ophthalmoscope a little in a little bit, but we're going to look in the back of the eye. Uh, pick out a vessel on the surface of the retina, the central retinal artery. I'm going to look right in there. So look over my shoulder and just pick out something on the wall. And don't look at me. So I'm going to come in here and look at that artery. And I can see that artery, any artery coming out of there. I'm seeing a branch of the central retinal artery. And now what I'm going to do, I won't hurt you, but I'm going to push on your eyeball a little bit. I'm just going to put pressure on your eyeball. Here I come. I'm putting pressure on the eyeball. I'm now increasing the pressure in his globe. And at a certain point, I'll increase the pressure so high, it'll exceed the diastolic pressure in his central retinal artery. When that happens, I'll see a big flash coming back to me from the uh, ophthalmoscope. Um, that means I've reached diastolic pressure. With a little practice, you can learn how much pressure it takes in a normal person to reach diastolic pressure and see that flash of the artery. <clears throat> it's very easy to see. You just have to practice doing it. Uh, and uh, it, it, it takes a lot of pressure. Uh, you have to press pretty darn hard before that thing collapses during diastole. Remember, that's going to be, in his case, about 60 millimeters of mercury. I'd have to push with that kind of pressure to cause that, uh, that artery to flash in diastole, to close during diastole. And of course, if I kept pressing on it, I'd reach systolic pressure, and the little artery would just be closed altogether. And he would say to me, I'm seeing a big black spot. Right? He'd lose his vision temporarily. I don't, I don't need to go that far. I'm, I'm interested in diastolic pressure. If I uh, am examining somebody who might have carotid artery disease and I hear a brewery in the neck and the pulses are reversed uh, when I do dynamic palp palpation, and I look here and I just touch lightly and that thing collapses during diastole, I've got three bits of evidence now that there's carotid artery disease. Again, I can't distinguish tight stenosis from occlusion, but I've got three bits of evidence. Now, in actual fact, just as a sort of a historical point, you can, uh, you can quantify and actually measure the pressure in the central retinal artery using this little gadget here. 
which is called an ophthalmodynamometer. It was invented by Dr. Byart, it's still called the Dr. Byart ophthalmodynamometer. And um, I remember very distinctly using this all the time because we didn't have good uh, non-invasive tests. Uh, and I'll show you how we use it at him. I'm not going to go to the detail of actually using it because in order to use it, you'd have to put a little uh, local anesthetic in the eye so I wouldn't hurt him. Uh, because you're going to take this little pad and you're going to put it in the outer canthus of the eye and, uh, and press it against the globe. See, we're going to press there and make a quantitative pressure of the kind that I did with my finger. Now, I'm not going to actually do that to him. I'm going to put it against the bone instead. And uh, I'm going to look with my ophthalmoscope. There, there I am looking at a vessel and uh, I'm going to increase the pressure and you see what the dial does. The dial goes up and when I reach diastolic pressure, I see that artery flash. I let it go and I have a measurement. And that little measurement can be con converted uh, into millimeters of mercury. And I can now know what the pressure is, diastolic pressure is in his central retinal artery. Let's say I measured in him and I found it to be 30. Well, I just measured the artery, the brachial artery. It was 60 diastolic pressure. It's 30 here. There's a 30 millimeter mercury drop off between the brachial artery and the central retinal artery. Another bit of evidence that there's uh, carotid stenosis. So there are several ways of examining the cerebral vessels uh, in your office, even without uh, any kind of fancy technology. Finally, uh, with the general examination, I always look at the extremities to see if there's any edema or swelling of the extremities, and I look at the fingernail beds to make sure that they're nice and pink, there isn't any uh, cyanosis uh, or any clubbing of the fingers which would indicate uh, some kind of a cardiovascular uh, disease. Now, obviously, there are other circumstances in which you might uh, feel the abdomen, feel the liver, if you thought that somebody might be having hepatic encephalopathy. But in most cases, what I have just done would be a fairly reasonable general examination for a neurological patient.